Hey, hello, and welcome back to Student of the Gun Radio, and we really appreciate you joining us this week. Now, this week, we've got a special treat for you. Now, if you've been paying attention to the show, if you've been listening in the last couple of weeks, you'll know that we were planning on going to the NRA's annual meetings in Houston, Texas. And right now, that's where we are. As we record this show, we're recording it from the rooftop of the Lone Wolf booth. That's right, the Lone Wolf booth as a rooftop patio, and they graciously allowed us to set up all of our recording gear on top of it. So we're actually overlooking the entire display or exhibit floor of the NRA annual meetings. Now, this is the 142nd NRA annual meeting and exhibit held in Houston, Texas this year. We're having a fantastic weekend. Uh, we've met a lot of great people. We, we cannot thank our fans enough for coming out and supporting us. We've done a number of book signing events. You guys have come up, you, you know, shake our, you know, shook our hands, took pictures. You know, we did, you know, the books. It's been really great. It's been really gratifying. Now, of course, with me running the board, got his headphones on. He's got a studly look on his face. It's Jared. Jared, how are we doing today? I'm doing great. How are you? Well, I'm doing pretty good, as you can tell. Now, before we get it too deep into the weeds, we want to thank our good friends, Caltech Firearms, Caltech Weapons of Cocoa, Florida. We were actually uh, at the Caltech booth this morning as we record this. We did a book signing there. It was, oh, was it was it a madhouse, Jared? It was insane. <laughs> it was insane. I think half the state of Texas is in this convention center right now. And, of course, we don't want to forget about our good friends over at Crossbreed Holsters of Republic, Missouri. Now, Crossbreed is here as well. And uh, your Super Tuck, if you're looking for the most comfortable in the waistband holster you can find, you're probably looking for a Crossbreed Super Tuck. Now, as we uh, go on about our journey here, we met a lot of fantastic people. And what we decided to do this week, Jared and I, is rather than uh, we wanted to do a student of the week and we did a student of the week question. We picked one out actually from some of the questions that, that you guys, you fans, have asked us here on the floor. And uh, one of our fans came up and, and, he, <laughs> and he asked a question. The reason I chose this one is because I think it's what a lot of men in the United States are going through right now. It's what they're thinking. He said, my wife wants to get some training. What should I do? Where should I get training for? <laughs> And it sounds like a simple question, but it's a fantastic question because, guys, look at, look, at your, look at your wives. If you can see your wives or girlfriends, look at them. And you know in your heart of hearts that you are the absolute last dude that should be training your wife with a handgun or with anything. That is the surest way to divorce court is to take your wife out and try and train her. You can't train your wife. Brothers and sisters, I have been doing this professionally for over 20 years now. I got a little bit of experience under my belt. However, when my wife wanted to get her concealed carry permit many years ago, I don't know, 10 plus years ago, uh, it was time for her to get a permit. She needed to go to training. I went out and I found another training company. I found another instructor and I took her to him. <laughs> At, I, learned, I learned my experience from trying to hang wallpaper with my wife the second year we were married, that that wasn't going to work. But uh, if you have a wife or a girlfriend or a significant other that wants to get trained, they're interested, they said to you, you've been waiting for them. You've been like, oh, honey, come on, you, you, should, you should get it. And they're like, no, no, no. Well, finally they did it. Finally they said, I want to get some training. Fantastic. Go out and find a, you know, interview them, call them, do whatever you need to do. Find a qualified, tra- an experienced instructor and take them and let him train there. Uh, I'll never forget this, and my, I won't let my wife forget it either, but she thinks it's funny, is when uh, I took my wife to get her concealed carry class, she went and she uh, spent like two or three days with this instructor, and she'd come back and she'd say, oh, the instructor said this, or the instructor said that today, and I'm like, honey, I said that 12 years ago. She's like, ah, you're just my husband. So, <laughs> husbands and boyfriends. If your wives, girlfriends, significant others, if they're looking to get training, stay out of divorce court, keep the lawyers off the phone, do some research, and find a guy that you trust to teach them. It, it'll be a much happier situation for you. And then when it's time to go shopping for a handgun, this is part B of this question. Well, my wife is looking for a handgun. Guys, she doesn't need to know about your favorite blaster. 
If it's going to be for her, it should be for her. You don't take a hand-me-down gun. When your wife says, I want to get a gun, that's not the time for you to go to your safe, find the gun that you shoot the least, give it to your wife, and go out and buy yourself a new one. Bad husband. Don't do that. (laughs) Take her shopping. Let her go out and let her find the gun that she likes, that she's comfortable with. She'll be much, much happier with it. Now, when we want to talk a little bit about our, our friends at the 4-H Shooting Sports Program. Now, in Episode 1 of Student of the Gun Radio, we talked about our friends at the 4-H Shooting Sports Program and the fact that right now, because of the current ammo crunch, the volunteer organizations, like the 4-H, they're hurting. You know, they're hurting for ammunition, and they really could use your help. Now, there's a fantastic organization. If, you, if you're a fan of the show, if you know Paul Markle, you know that I strongly believe in and that I support the 4-H Shooting Sports Program and that I've been actively involved with teaching and supporting the Ohio 4-H Shooting Education Camp. Every year for the last 12, 13, 14 years, Jared, probably, at least, or it might even be more, it might be 15 years now, uh, at, I've been working with them. They do a fantastic job. They grow every year. Hundreds of kids go, and they spend time. They spend a week. Actually, they have two camps now, uh, two week-long camps. But my point is this, ladies and gentlemen, they need your help. If you're sitting out there in my radio audience, if you're sitting out there listening, you think, well, I, you know, what can I do to, to help them? I, I'm, not, you know, I'm not a millionaire. I'm not a philanthropist. I can't write them a big check. That's cool. Look in your safe. Look in your ammo locker. Do you have a thousand rounds of 22 rimfire ammunition that you could live without, that you could spare? Get with the 4-H shooting sports program. And right now, in Ohio, they're getting ready to do their annual shooting education camp. It's going to be in July this year. And if you go, you know, go on the internet and you just Google Ohio 4-H shooting sports, you can find all the information you need about Ohio 4-H shooting sports right there from the internet. Now, the director of the camp is a fantastic gentleman. His name is Larry Harris. And this guy, let me tell you, folks, the, the work that he puts in for these kids, it's, it's phenomenal. And, but Larry could use your help. He, he is in charge of not only coordinating and organizing the camp, but he has to make sure that when, you know, 200-some kids arrive, that they have enough 22 ammo, shotgun shells, clays, all that, so that these kids can get the maximum experience out of that camp. And if you, like I said, if you've got some factory fresh, you've got some 22 ammo, 500 rounds, 1,000 rounds, and you get a hold of Larry Harris at the Ohio 4-H Shooting Sports Program and say, Larry, hey, I listened to Student of the Gun Radio. They said that you might need a little bit of help. What can I do to help you? And anything that you can do to help these young people, because when I look out across this floor at the thousands and thousands thousands of people in this building it's not just middle-aged white men it's men and their wives their girlfriends their sons their daughters you've got kids in strollers you got little babies being carried and you know in papoose packs and it's it's you know grandparents and grandchildren these are families and the children that are walking around on the floor of the nra annual meeting right now they are the future. They are the future of the shooting sports and the Ohio 4-H shooting sports and all 4-H shooting sports. They're not just about kids and guns. What they're about is they're about youth development. They're about teaching young people and helping them grow into responsible adults. And they do that through the shooting sports because, let's face it, kids love shooting sports. You introduce a 10-year-old, 12-year-old kid is the shooting sports and you let him enjoy it you don't punish him with with you know hard kicking shotgun ammunition and crazy stuff like that you get that kid hooked with a 22 rifle you know you get him out breaking some clays get him breaking a couple of clays that kid's going to get the bug and he is going to be a dedicated second amendment supporter he's going to be a responsible citizen that kid is going to be the one that's saving people's lives not taking people's lives so if you can do anything to help the, the 4-H shooting sports program, and like I said, uh, right now as, as you're listening to this, it's about two months before uh, the annual shooting education camp begins. So 
if you've got the opportunity, if you want to, you know, you've got the, the opportunities there. I'm giving it to you guys right now. I'm putting the opportunity forth uh, for you. But if you have the inclination, I really strongly would suggest that anything you can do to support him, do it. And that's is the gentleman's name is Larry Harris. He's the director of the Ohio 4-H Shooting Sports Program, and he puts on their annual shooting education camp. So anything you folks can do to support him, uh, um, please do it. Now, folks, <laughs> we've got, um, I don't know, sad, tragic, ridiculous uh, story to report. Uh, we saw this just a couple of days ago that apparently the, the what did you say, the, the Pine Ridge, Pine Ridge uh, School, I believe it was, Pine Eagle, I don't know, School in Oregon. Jared's looking it up right now on his magic monitor. It's the Pine Eagle Charter School in Oregon. Thank you very much, Jared, for keeping me on track. Well, at the Pine Eagle Charter School, some of the staff members decided that they really wanted to drive home the importance of training and preparing for an active shooter situation. So what they did during a staff meeting is staff members put on masks and broke into the meeting with blank firing guns and opened fire on the people that were present. Ladies and gentlemen, and children of all ages, that is not how you train people to respond to an active shooter or a threat. That is not how we do it. That is reckless, that is negligent, that is is grossly negligent, and I I don't even, I, I hardly know what to say about that. Now, fortunately for the staff members, they weren't in, uh, in deep free America, they weren't in free America. And they didn't get shot down. But the truth is, is they very well could have. We don't do stuff like this. And this was not an announced drill. They didn't say, oh, we're going to go ahead and, and uh, do this soon. They just sprung it on them. Folks, bad idea. Do not do things like that. Crazy stuff. It's just, it's not worth it. There are better ways to, tr- if, you, if you genuinely want yourself and your staff members, if you want them to be trained, to be able to deal with, a deadly force scenario, there are better ways to go about it than just having a couple of guys put on ski masks and come busting in with blank firing guns and shooting up the place. Not good. Bad juju. Bad, bad staff members. Smoke yourself. For my Army, my Army friends in the audience, you know what that means. For my Marine Corps friends, we could say, uh, get some. <laughs> All right, what, what's the next topic we want to talk about, uh, Jared? All right, I think our next topic needs to be revisiting that pocket lifesaver. Okay, the, last week we introduced it. We talked about the incident that happened in Fort Worth, Texas, uh, where an officer was attempting to apprehend a bad guy. Bad guy turned, shot at him. Officer shot back. Bad guy is now worm food. He's deceased. Yay, team. But the officer took a bullet through the upper leg, which is a bad wound through his uh, femoral artery. And uh, from the story that we read, it said that he had recently received training, and he knew what to do, and he, he actually, but he didn't have a kit on him. According to the story, it, he cut his pant leg open, and he actually made a makeshift tourniquet, which is fantastic. That's great. And there were people, uh, if you've been watching Student of the Gun, if you've been paying attention to studentofthegun.com, uh, what you'll know is we actually put up a material from the, the trauma program manager, Dr. Blansfield, in Boston, at the of the Boston Medical Center, and they said that, and I quote, tourniquets saved lives after the uh, Boston at- terrorist attack. How did they save lives? Well, folks, you're, the human body is not really that mystical of a thing. You've got plumbing. You've got pipes. If a pipe springs a leak and you lose that bright red fluid, if you lose too much of it, you're going to expire. And that's really all there is to it. And it is, it's, you know, it's not all that complicated. If someone is bleeding, if they have a major bleeding injury, it doesn't have to be from a terrorist attack. It could be from a rollover car crash. It could be from an industrial accident. It could be from an uh, outdoor accident. A good friend of mine is actually an instructor. He's an uh, uh, Air Force pararescue instructor. And one of his students called him up and said, I saved my dad's life with what you taught me. And he said, well, what, did you, what happened? He said he was out with his chainsaw cutting wood. And something happened, a piece, a tree limb fell, 
and it impaled him directly through his upper leg, and it it uh, cut his uh, femoral artery. And fortunately, his son was there, his son who'd been trained by my friend Mitch Vance, and he went up and he put a tourniquet on his leg, stopped him from bleeding to death, and saved his life. Uh, and you know, if you're out uh, in the middle of the woods cutting wood with a chainsaw, you're probably it's going to probably take the ambulance a little while to get to you. If you can't treat that situation, if you can't stop gap that life-threatening injury right there, that person is probably going to die. And uh, we've had some some folks out there who uh, you know who claim to be uh, medical professionals, EMT Bravos, and what have you. And if you're an EMT out there and you're out saving people's lives. Drive on. Rock on, brothers. Thank you very much for doing that. But what we need to understand is that responsible American citizens can and do save people's lives every day. They save people's lives by stopping bad people when they use guns, you know. We have armed citizens out there using their firearms in a responsible manner to stop bad people, you know, to stop bad people. And, but you can't shoot a wound closed. If a person has a life-threatening injury, you can't shoot it closed. You can't use your concealed carry pistol to stop them from bleeding to death. You need another plan. And why do we have, you know, EDC or everyday carry is a very, very popular uh, term right now. Everybody likes to talk about EDC. You know, what's your everyday carry? And guys, you know, guys being what we are, Guys take their phones and they take pictures of their everyday carry kit and they share it with their buddies and they're like, I have this holster and this pocket knife and this flashlight and so forth. And you say to them, like, well, why do you do that? Well, I, I do that so that I'll have what I need on my body if I should ever need it. You know, I, I talked about previously a, a good uh, uh, an instructor. When I went to the police academy, one of our instructors told us, he said, look, when you roll out of the car, if it's not on your body, you're probably not going to have it when you need it. And, and the point in that was, you know, it reinforced to we young, you know, young uh, troopers, young cadets, don't think, well, that's bulky, that's heavy, that's uncomfortable. I'm just going to stash it in the car. And, uh, you know, wh- if I ever need it, I'll go back to the car and I'll, I'll get it then. And uh, our instructor is like, that's... Because what's going to happen is the car is going to be 100 yards away from you, and that gear that you needed is going to be in that car, and it's going to do you absolutely no good. He said, if you don't have it attached to your body when you bail out of your cruiser, you're not going to have it when it's necessary. Okay, great. And, you know, primarily what he was talking about then was he was talking about, you know, our, our firearms. And not only that you wouldn't carry a firearm, but what about spare ammunition? What about handcuffs? What about extra cuffs? What about, you know whatever you need and, and you know every every cop has you know the batman uh, you know utility belt full of good gear well how about medical gear how about emergency medical gear and i'm not talking about band-aids you know i'm not talking about band-aids and aspirin and neosporin and stuff like that i'm talking about material that you could actually use in a life-threatening emergency now some of our detractors have said well you can't you can't just buy that and use it. You need to know what you're doing. Well, obviously, that's like that would be like me saying, well, all you have to do is buy a gun and all your self-defense issues are over. Well, that's ridiculous. If you're going to use a handgun and you're going to use it for self-defense, I very, very strongly suggest that you get your butt into a training class or more, more than one training class. Take the first one and then take another one and build your skill set. Folks, if you've got guys out there, if you're one of those guys who's been to three or four schools, you know, you went to Gunsight, you went to the SIG Academy, Smith & Wesson Academy, TDI, Tactical Response, you know, you name it. And you're listening to me right now. You're like, dude, I'm good. I, you know, I graduated top in my class at Texas Pistol Academy. Hey, rock on, dude. That's fantastic. That shows me that you have the intelligence and the physical ability to learn how to save somebody's life. Jared. I, I heard a rumor. Tell, give me a rumor, Jared. What, do you, what rumor did you hear? I heard that the instructors that teach these classes, they just want you to come take it because they want your money. <laughs> Jared says that, that the only reason that they're shooting instructors is because they're trying to, to milk you out of your money. Uh, 
I don't, I don't think, I don't know personally know of any shooting instructors that do it for a living that are millionaires. Uh, I know some of them that are able to feed their families, but uh, you don't become a millionaire being a shootings instructor. Uh, it's no different. You know, if you wanted to learn how to drive a car at 180 miles an hour, would you say, "Well, I've got a driver's license. I'll just push the accelerator down and go really, really fast"? That's probably not the best way to do it. Uh, what if you wanted to try out for the NFL? You know, you wanted to be in a, you wanted to to go to the Olympics and you know d- compete in judo in the Olympics. Would you say, well, I had, you know, when I was in sixth grade, I, I competed in wrestling, so I'm probably ready for the Olympics now. Well, no. If you can carry a gun, if you can make the decision, if you are intelligent enough and responsible enough and mature enough to make a life or death decision as whether or not to fire a gun at a human being or to withhold your fire or, hey, that per- I have to shoot that person in order to save my own life, if you can do that, don't you think that you're mature enough, that you're intelligent enough to look at someone that's injured, that's laying on the ground screaming, holding their leg, and their leg is sideways and there's bright red blood pumping out to say, hmm, I should probably do something to help that person. I could take a training course that would teach me what I would need to do in that event to stop gap their injuries. And when I say stop gap, I'm not talking about doing field surgery. I'm talking about applying the minimum measures necessary to keep that person stable so the ambulance has time to show up. I mean, where do you live on planet Earth? Are you a five-minute ambulance ride from every emergency trauma center? Or are you a 20-minute ride? Or are you a 30-minute ride? How long, if right now, if something bad happened to you, you know, the, uh, the power saw went off the table and sliced open your leg, how long would it take the professionals with the big shiny box with the, the flashy lights to get to you with their backpacks full of gear? Well, if they can't be there in less than three minutes and you have a femoral bleed or you have a, an arterial bleed, you're not going to make it, Sparky, unless somebody does something. And when it comes down to it, ladies and gentlemen, when it really comes down to it, if you are ever in a situation where another person whether it's your spouse, your child, a friend, a coworker, someone has a medical crisis emergency. You know, they there's something going on. And you're going to want to do something. Unless you're just really just a horrible person, you're going to want to help them. The big question is, will you have the skill set? Will you have the ability to help that person? I'm not trying to run this into the ground, but I really feel like at this point in time in our nation's history, this is something that needs to be addressed. Uh, We've got a lot of people out there right now. In the last four years, we have more gun owners in America than we ever have at any time in our nation's history. We've got more people carrying guns. We have more people out there, you know, lawful citizens carrying firearms who've gotten training, who have decided, I'm going to take care of myself. It is my duty. It is my responsibility First and foremost, to protect myself, to protect my family, protect my home. That is fantastic, and I, I, I can't be happier about that. But at the same time, you say, well, I have a gun, and look what, look what happened in our uh, instance in Fort Worth, Texas. We had a guy, we had a police officer who won his gunfight. You know, the bad guy was down for the count. That guy won his gunfight, but he still ended up bleeding. What do we say? Good guys can and do bleed as well. Two weeks ago, we had another Fort Worth incident. It was our that was our Craigslist deal gone bad, where the uh, guy was you know guy set up a robbery via Craigslist. Well, the good guy was a Texas concealed carry holder. He shot the bad guy down. The bad guy expired, but the good guy ended up bleeding. Sometimes you win your gunfight, and you end up bleeding. Well, once the, you know, the echo of gunfire has gone away and you know, the, the smoke has cleared, what are you going to do now? You can't wish you know, that wound closed up. And what you need to ask yourself is, if you've taken the time to learn how to defend yourself, to learn to be an independent, responsible citizen, do you have the time? Do you have 8 to 16 hours to actually get your butt in a class and take some training that could potentially save your child's life, save your wife's life, your husband's life, 
the lives of the people that you care about. You know, I've got I've had some folks that have sent in letters like, "Well, I, I'm not I'm not going to be doing medical training on strangers because they'll sue me and I don't know that." I'm like, "Okay, well, first of all, what are you all about? If you were at a baseball game and a guy was choking to death, would you say, "Well, sucks to be you, brother. I'm not helping you. You're a stranger." Uh, how do you? I mean, if that is your feeling, if you really feel like that, or you were in in Boston when the bomb went off. You weren't injured, but there's a guy laying on the ground, and there's blood pumping out of his arm. You never met him before in your life. You're going to look down at that guy and say, I'm sorry, stranger. I'm not going to help you. Do you have a mirror? Do you own a mirror? Is there one in your house? Because if you're that person that says, I would never help a stranger because I'm afraid of being sued, then I don't know how you shave every day or how you put your makeup on because I don't see how you could possibly look yourself in the mirror. I'm not telling you to go around and be medical man with a cape and looking for it, but sometimes it's not about you looking for it. It's about trouble coming to you. When you leave your door every day, you leave your doorstep, you don't know what's going to happen. It could be nothing. It could be you're standing on the side of a street and a bomb explodes and people are, are bleeding and dying all around you. If you're not one of those victims, you have a choice to make. You can either be part of the solution or you can be part of the problem. And that's a choice that each and every one of you has to make every single day. You can say to yourself, am I going to be part of the solution in this nation? Or am I just going to fall back and just be part of the helpless masses? And I truly believe in my heart of hearts that if you're listening to Student of the Gun Radio right now, that you genuinely want to be part of the solution, not part of the problem. There's enough human beings, there's enough people walking around sucking up all the valuable oxygen on this planet that are part of the problem. And if you're one of my listeners, I feel very strongly that the fact that you're here, that you've tuned in, that you're listening to this show, that means that uh, you probably want to be part of the solution. So if that means, hey, I might have to block out a weekend and I might have to take a little bit of training, then uh, go ahead and do it. Do it. Take that training. And if you've got that training, if you're one of those guys that like, I've talked to you I was like, I, uh, after the Boston attacks, I've talked to a lot of good friends, a lot of acquaintances, and they're like, you know, I've got a trauma kit. It's in my car. It's in the trunk. Uh, I've got one that's in my range bag. And, I, I, you know, it's, it's a fantastic kit, and I know how to use it. And I say, well, where is that kit when you're just going about your life? When you're just out there with your family, you know, you're going to the grocery store, you're going to the restaurant, you know, you're going to the movies, is that kit with you? Well, and most folks are like, no, it's not. You know, it's in my truck. Well, if you are in the movie theater and somebody is dying and your truck is out in the parking lot 250 yards away, it might as well be on the moon. Would you, you know, do you take your, your self-defense gun and, and you lock it away? So, well, if I need it, it's in my car. You know, if you're somewhere, it's like the Luby's Cafeteria incident that we learned about many, many years ago. That woman was disarmed by law. You know, the state of Texas way back then before they became enlightened, she was forbidden to carry a gun. So she locked it in her car, went into Luby's Cafeteria to have dinner with her parents. Her parents were murdered in front of her eyes because her gun was locked in her car in the parking lot. She couldn't do anything to help them. And, you know, if you're locking your, the gear that you need to survive, if it, like, like I, when I went to the academy and my instructor said, if it's not on your body somewhere, you're not going to have it when you need it. And that is the whole purpose that we, you know, we came up with this pocket lifesaver. We, I've been teaching medical training for a long time, taught it to U.S. military troops. I was trained by some of the best. My instructors were in 18 Delta and an Air Force pararescue. And for the, those of you who don't know it, you can uh, Google it. But an 18 Delta is a special forces medic. They're about as close to a trauma surgeon without being an actual doctor as you can get. And one of my other instructors was an Air Force PJ. He was a pararescue instructor that actually taught other Air Force pararescue guys how to save people's lives. And both of these guys had combat experience. Both of them had saved many, many lives. And they taught me how to teach the TCCC program. They taught me how to teach the Beyond the Band-Aid program. And all the gear that we have in the PLS, it's the same gear that you'll find in an individual first aid kit or IFAC 
that's being issued to troops that are going overseas right now. So it, the gear has been tested and tried. It's valuable. It's good stuff. And the question you have to ask yourself is, do I want my gear locked up so that I have to go somewhere and find it, or do I want to have it available to me? You want to have it in your purse, in your pocket, in your bag. You know, the PLS is small enough that, you know, you could stick it in a sock. Get up in the morning, stick it in your sock, forget about it for the rest of the day. Uh, we're not going to talk any more about that right now, but I thought based upon what has happened in the last week or so that we really needed to address it and touch on it. And you know what? If you don't want to get the pocket lifesaver from Student of the Gun Gear Store, don't. I don't care. But get something. Prepare yourself. You don't want to take Beyond the Band-Aid. Find a school that teaches some type of traumatic medicine. You've already taken the steps. You're listening to this show. You are a student of the gun. But being a student of the gun doesn't always mean shooting. It means being a responsible citizen. Being a student of the gun means being part of the solution, not part of the problem. Now, folks, we could not be happier to be bringing you this show from the floor of the NRA annual meetings and convention. We're, we're so happy to have been here. We've seen just all kinds of fantastic folks. <laughs> I've got to share one with you guys today. Uh, we were doing a book signing at, uh, at our friend Kiapa Firearms. We were at the Kiapa Firearms booth. There's a huge crowd, and a lovely young woman came out of the crowd. She approached me. I, we had the books there, and I expected her to ask me a question about student of the gun. She goes, can I ask you a question? And I said, well, yes. Yeah. She goes, where can I find Matt Hughes? <laughs> She just took that pin and stuck it right in my bubble. <laughs> Maybe we should have made her the student of the week. <laughs> but we're here. We're, we're spending some time with, with genuine American patriots, and it's a great weekend. It's a great time to do it. We've been with our friends, you know, Crossbreed Holsters of Liberty, Missouri. We've been with our friends, Keltec Weapons. And we really want to thank the folks at Lone Wolf Distributors for opening up the patio of their really cool uh, super slick booth here so we could go up on the second floor overlook the floor of the exhibits right here we see lots of smiling faces right now there are literally ladies and gentlemen thousands upon thousands of american patriots walking around the floors of the convention center here in houston texas so this is me paul markle your favorite professor and host of student of the gun radio telling you and reminding you you're a beginner once but you should be a student for life